lecture is going to be divided into three parts. First, I'm going to go over the science. I know that this is a meeting of scientists, but there are so many different PhDs that I've met in the last 24 hours in terms of backgrounds. I thought it would be important to just go over the most recent scientific developments and advancements in CRISPR technology. We have to go over a couple of distinctions. I'm a Dominican. I love St. Thomas. St. Thomas says that thinking is about making distinctions. And so I would like to articulate a few distinctions that hopefully will clarify how we go forward in thinking about this. And then I'm going to talk about the ethics. And I'm going to highlight the Catholic perspective, because one of the things you may or may not realize is that there are really two different strands of bioethics out there today. There's a faith and reason-based bioethics, and then there's a secular-based ethics driven primarily by autonomy concerns. And they will come to diametrically opposing conclusions for some of the things we'll be talking about today. So we'll begin with the, with the editing, the, the science of editing. And so I'm going to begin with a basic slide, which I've taken from one of my stacks from GenBio, Bio 103, which is the freshman introductory class that I teach at Providence College, my favorite class to teach, actually. They know nothing. And it's wonderful to introduce them to something, right? So, <laughs> so in so many ways, you are creating in that sense. So we're going to talk now about a human genome. And the genome is the genetic information for the organism. And if you look at a typical cell, what you will find is that most of the genome is localized to the nucleus. So you have the nuclear genome, the very classic images of uh, metaphase chromosomes. Most people don't realize is that part of the human genome is also found in the mitochondria. We are not going to be dealing with that particular issue today. So if you take one of these chromosomes and you stretch them out, you get basically an icon the iconic DNA double helix. And one of the things that I point out is that DNA can be imaged in the following way. So it's, it's text, really. It's a pattern of GAs, Ts, and Cs, where each one of these letters represents a particular chemical base. Now, this is, turns out this is the gene that my students and I have been looking at for the past seven years. This is yeast vax inhibitor. And if you're a molecular biologist, you'll be able to read this code. You will know that the ATG indicates the beginning of the gene. You have a TAA that indicates the end of the gene in the way that a capital letter indicates the beginning of an English sentence. And then you have a period at the end. And so the code, the, the information is there. It can be displayed as text, and now we actually have a machine that allows us to edit that text just like you have a word processor. And so this is the machine. It's a CRISPR machine. It's made up of several parts. You have a part called Cas9, and then a part driven by an RNA molecule. And all I'm going to say at this point is that this machine can be used to do a whole myriad of things. Now, I put this image in here because a lot of people want to know what it looks like. This is an artist's portrayal based on the crystal structure of CRISPR. So the idea is that you really have a protein machine. And the protein machine is able to uh, cut. And that's the idea. The idea here is that the protein machine is able to cut at a very precise location. So if you imagine the human genome, we have 3 billion of these letters. And we have 46 chromosomes, each chromosome, let's say, a volume of the encyclopedia. And you, what we are now able to do is we're able to go into volume three, page 424, the third word of the fifth line of the second sentence, and we're able to change the B into a D. That's what this machine allows us to do. We can go in with such precision that it's revolutionizing the way that we do science. What happens, basically, is that you make a cut, and depending upon what else you give to that cell, the cell will either repair the cut, replacing the information that was there with the information you give it, or it will replace it in the absence of additional information, often damaging the gene and therefore silencing it. So this gives you a, gives you a way of turning the gene off. And so this is a timeline. Most people don't realize how incredibly recent this is. Now, the original, the, the first 
discovery of anything that related to CRISPR happened in 1987, where micro microbiologists identified particular sequences of DNA that were just strange. They were repeating elements. What we now discover is that CRISPR is actually part of the, the bacterial cell's ability to protect itself against invading viruses. You and I have an immune system. You might, you might have had chicken pox. You will have chicken pox only once because your immune system will remember the chicken pox virus. In many ways, bacteria have something analogous. They can remember when a virus has infected them in the past. And part of that immune system, part of that defense system, is constituted by what we now have called CRISPR. But what we have done is we've taken the machine out of its normal context, and we've used it as a tool. And so what we have is we have things like we can go ahead and target RNA in mammalian cells. We can now engineer mammalian cells. This was done in 2013. And it is expected that the team that uh, describe the use of CRISPR as a, as a gene editing tool. They're expected to receive the Nobel Prize imminently. I mean, it's, it's so revolutionary in terms of what we can do. To give you some examples, some real life examples of how it's being used, you have here a mouse model of human hereditary tyrosinemia, which is the inability of the mouse to metabolize tyrosine. And so what we do now is we can actually, and what biologists have done is they've used CRISPR to alter some of the genes of the mouse's liver and have repaired the liver in such a way that the mouse is cured of this hereditary disease. Now, one of the things my students will ask is they'll say, was every single gene, every single cell in the liver mutated? It turns out you actually don't need every single cell to be mutated. You need enough cells mutated or restored to the normal wild type sequence in order for the liver to recover function in such a way that it, it obl obliterates the, the, the disease itself, the symptomology, the phenotype of the mutation. Now, one of the things that's also interesting is that CRISPR is being used for environmental concerns. I'm just gonna raise this as a very big question that we as a society and we as a church have to face in the future. So what we have here is the, the, the notion of a gene drive. So here you have mosquitoes, flies, insects. And what you have is you have normal inheritance. And this is the, the, the Mendelian inheritance that was first really articulated clearly by Gregor Mendel, who was not a monk. He was a friar. I just point that out. I just point that out. As a friar, he. He was a friar. He was an Augustinian friar. And I'm sure I can ask my brother monks here. The Augustinians are properly speaking friars, not monks. That's correct. That's correct. All right. <laughs> so I just, it's a Catholic society. I just want to clarify the lingo. All right. So here we've got, normally what you have is that you have a situation for 50% of the progeny of any mating will inherit a particular version of a gene. What we can now do is that we can set up the gene so that it is accompanied by the CRISPR machine so that once it is introduced into an animal, the other copy, I just remind you that each of you has two copies for most of the genes that you carry, one from your mother and one from your father. What happens is the one copy will actually edit the other copy so that you will now have two copies of that gene rather than one. And what, what, it, what inevitably turns out is that it will allow you to, in a sense, overtake the population and allow that population of animals to inherit your gene of interest. Now, why is this interesting? This is interesting because what you can do is you can use the CRISPR machine to make animals sterile. And then you can introduce a gene drive into a population, in this case, a population of mosquitoes, and it will decimate the, the mosquito population because what happens is that you, you, you make males that mate with females, and then the, fee, the offspring, their offspring, are unable to survive either to adulthood 
or are sterile in themselves, so you can prevent the population from increasing in size. So this in November 2008, this is a proof of principle that you can actually do that in the lab. Now it's interesting because there's a company, Oxitec, that has actually used gene drives. They used it in Brazil, in the Cayman Islands. They're not using genetic gene drives. They're, 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 they're not using CRISPR per se. They have a slightly different technology, but it's able to suppress the mosquito population in these islands. Now, and the question that, we, that eth bioethicists are asking themselves is, what are the ethics of eradicating an entire species of mosquito? Now, keep in mind that we're not talking about eradicating all mosquitoes. There are 3,000 biological species of mosquitoes. The, the, the talk here is to just eradicate one species, Aegypti, which is associated with Zika virus and a whole bunch of other human pests. Uh, what does that mean? I have students who say, absolutely not. And I say, well, we've already done it once. We don't have smallpox. So we've already eradicated one particular species. I'm putting that in quotation marks because we're dealing with viruses here. But one particular kind of species, we've had no problems uh, eradicating smallpox. What were the similarities and differences with regards to uh, eradicating Aegypti? You also have very recently, a couple of months ago, the development of the CRISPR-Cas gene drive, this time for mice. The idea here is what we would use this to, for rodent control. So now instead of having in, uh, pesticides that, and this is the argument, instead of having pesticides that chemically pollute the environment, we could use this genetic technology to eradicate the same population of rodents in a way that minimize the, uh, the harmful impact on the environment. Now with humans, you have two basic types. This is one of the distinctions that I'm just going to uh, echo later again. You have in vivo editing, and here you take the CRISPR machine and you introduce it directly into the human being. And you have the editing happen within the human body. You also have ex vivo editing, where we'll take stem cells from the patient genetically engineer the stem cells outside the patient in the lab, do quality control on the genetically engineered, genetically edited cells, and then selectively reintroduce the particular cells of interest back into the patient to deal with the disease or the um, infection, whatever it is that you want to deal with. So he, that's in vivo, and then there's ex vivo. So ex vivo right now, there are experiments that are attempting to do this primarily against sickle cell disease. And so sickle cell patients have a single genetic change. Uh, basically, they have a T instead of an A in their genome. The idea here is we're going to take out their blood stem cells, the hemopoietic stem cells, use CRISPR in order to correct the defect, and then reintroduce these stem cells back into the bone marrow to replace and re, re, refresh the, the, entire bone, the entire blood system of the patient. And just as proof of principle, earlier this year, last month, you have basically highly efficient therapeutic gene editing for hemopoietic stem cells. So this is, this is going to happen very, very soon. I actually know people who are actually in the process of doing that. You also have age-related macular degeneration. This is an example of in vivo gene editing. The idea here is that we would be able to introduce the CRISPR machine directly into your eye, and the eye would then, the, gene, the cells in the, in the retina of your eye would undergo genetic editing, and the genetic editing would prevent those cells from dying, and therefore uh, help you, uh, well, at least prevent the disease from progressing. This is age-related macular degeneration. And this is a paper dealing with that, published a couple of years ago. Now, what's really interesting is that uh, I have a couple of friends at Editas Medicine, one of the premier CRISPR companies in Cambridge. And these companies are in conversation with the Catholic Church, actually, in order to, they want to do public relations in light of what happened last November, as I'll talk shortly, with the human gene editing in China. They want to kind of um, do proactive work in trying to engage 
as they would put it, other stakeholders into this conversation. What you have here is there is a form of inherited blindness which occurs because of a splicing defect in a particular gene, and they are beginning clinical trials where what they want to do is they want to remove this misspliced gene, allowing the cells to recover normal photoreceptors. And it turns out that you only need 10% of your retina to function properly in order for you to actually have, you're not gonna be a 2020, but you won't be blind. You will be able to function normally uh, and, and carry on an, a, a life. Your, your glasses may be thick, but you're not gonna be legally blind. You may have heard, of course, that we are now editing human embryos. So this is the, the in August 2017, uh, Shukrat Metalipov's lab in Oregon were one of the first to use CRISPR in order to edit human embryos. I'm not going to go into, this is very controversial at the moment. It's not quite clear how the editing actually happened. We know that the editing happened. We know that it happened because they injected the, so there were two different ways. You could actually, there was the sperm mutation, there was a healthy egg. The sperm mutation, you could actually inject the CRISPR into the embryo. There was also an attempt to inject the CRISPR along with the sperm that was mutant. And you had different, the embryos that resulted had very different phenotypes. They looked different. And it's not quite clear if we have a mechanistic explanation for what happened between this step and that step. So we've got these arrows here. We think that these arrows explain something, but we're not sure, and it's highly controversial as to whether or not they actually did what they thought they did. Now, and this is the November 2008, this is last Thanksgiving. This was He Zhanghui's announcement at the International Stem Cell Meeting in Hong Kong, where he announced that he had genetically altered twins um, so that one of their genes, uh, would, I'm trying to figure out, how, so he, he was able to convince a couple where the father was HIV positive that in order to protect their children from his HIV, he should be allowed to edit one of the genes uh, that would make them, in theory, um, resistant to, if not immune to HIV. And the reason why we know that these individual, if these individual children had in fact been edited as they are, as they have been reported to be, they would have been resistant because 17% of the Caucasian population, especially the European population, is actually resistant to HIV infection because of this mutation. It's a CCR5 delta 32 mutation. And so there's an, so he attempted to genetically engineer the embryo so that they would resemble 17% of the human population. Thankfully, we don't know exactly where these uh, children are. My, my students are like, well, why don't we figure it out and do all the tests on them? I go, precisely because you would end up doing tests on them for the rest of their lives. I'm hoping that we will protect their privacy so that they will be able to live somewhat normal lives. So, um, but this generated an intense firestorm of, in terms of the global ethics. There have been recent calls for a global moratorium on germline gene editing. The conversation is ongoing. So a couple of distinctions that I would like to point out. The first one is ex vivo versus in vivo, and we've already de dealt with that. So ex vivo is you take the cells out, you take the cells out of the patient, and you genetically alter them outside of the patient's body in, his, in your lab, you put it back into the patient. And in vivo, you actually have to introduce the genetic engineering machine, the editing with the CRISPR machine directly into the patient. Next distinction is this one between somatic versus germline. And this is actually the discussion that is going on in the Catholic Church at the moment with regards to somatic versus germline therapy. So somatic therapy is basically, so we have ex vivo somatic therapy. We just talked about that, where what you're doing is you're altering the patient's cells outside of his body. There is in vivo somatic therapy where you're altering the patient's cells inside his body, but these cells are not the reproductive cells. 
and that's the real difference. So somatic cell gene therapy involves editing every single cell other than the cells that give rise to progeny, and that in our species involves the sperm and the egg. So if you don't, if you don't involve the gametes, if you don't involve sperm and egg, then you're doing somatic cell gene therapy, but if you involve the, the, um, the, the sperm, or the egg, you're involving gene line, uh, gene line, germline gene therapy. And this is uh, an important question because a question that has been posed to me is the following. If we develop somatic editing gene line, uh, somatic editing therapy, in theory, we would not need germline gene editing because we'll just fix it when the kid is born. Now what's really interesting is that some of these diseases actually begin to manifest in utero. It is striking that a couple of months ago there was a paper published, I believe it was Nature Translational Medicine, where they did gene editing on fetal mice by injecting the, the, the CRISPR machine into the amniotic fluid three days before birth. This allowed enough of the gene editing to enter the, the mouse's lungs and edit the cells of the, of the lungs of the mouse so that the mouse was actually born cured of a genetically imposed uh, lung disease. And so the idea here, and this is it, it, the idea that the people are asking is, in light of the developments of somatic, uh, somatic cell gene therapy, can we forever ban germline gene therapy? Uh, in principle, this will close off altering and modifying future generations in a way that we may not be able to understand or control today. A couple of minutes on this distinction between therapy and enhancement. It's the one that is usually brought forward, especially amongst Catholic circles, to respond to, a, uh, to, to outline a particular line in the sand that we cannot cross. So is it a robust one? That's the question that I want to ask. And, um, in order for me to explore this, I want to ask this following question. For some of you, this is a very important question. What should target LDL levels be for patients at risk for cardiovascular disease? And so at a certain age in life, you go in for your blood test, they measure LDL, they measure HDL, and they tell you, oh, okay, you're at risk for cardiovascular disease, we're going to give you statins. And some people are on statins for the rest of their lives. Now here's the question. What should the target levels be? So if you look at the average LDL levels amongst US adults, 20 to 74, and I'm assuming most of us fit within that bracket, it's 119 milligrams per deciliter, where the normal range is 90 to 130 milligrams per deciliter. Now, but, Oops, I think I missed, okay. So if you look, though, at the recommended target LDL level, so this is standard of care in the United States, what they will tell you is that optimal is less than 100, and they're going to force your LDL levels below 100. Now, how far below 100? If you look at hunter-gatherer tribes, their average LDL levels is 70 milligrams per deciliter. For non-human primates, it's 30 to 50 milligrams per deciliter. And there is a single human being that we know of because he carries a mutation in PCSK9. His average LDL levels is 15 milligrams per deciliter, and he's great. <laughs> he's healthy. Now, this, this, here's the question. To what should we lower those levels down to? Now, if you... If you are going to say that therapy returns the patient to the species norm, which is what you people usually define therapy as, then what you have to say is that we have to target your LDL level so they end up between 70 to 130 milligrams per deciliter. The difficulty is that if you look at all the data, all the data suggests that if we can drive it below 70, even better. And so I've talked to cardiologists, and they're like, oh, we go down as far as we can, which, is me, which basically means this. For millions of people in the United States, they are already being enhanced, but pharmacologically, not genetically. 
because we are pushing one particular parameter of their biology beyond the species norm. And when I bring this up with Catholic bioethicists, some of whom themselves are on statins, they have no problems with that. So clearly, therapy versus enhancement cannot be as robust a distinction as we are making it out to be if we are already violating that as an ethical norm in contemporary practice in medicine. And if we can do that pharmacologically, the question is, is there something inherently different doing it genetically versus pharmacologically? I don't think there is, because I think we're just changing the human being. So we should, and so this is the standard of care, right? So we should lower the LDL levels even beyond the species norm to preserve and protect human health. And so I am proposing, I've actually written this up already, that the therapy enhancement distinction is not as robust as we make it out to be because there are therapeutic enhancements that promote the human good of health. And so they have to be therapy versus non-therapy. And we can, there's a huge discussion about what constitutes the reality of that distinction. All right, let's move now in the last um, 10 minutes or so uh, to deal with ethics. And this is the other half of my brain, so I, I work in bioethics as well. So what's really interesting is that I deal a lot with secular bioethicists. So a question that has often come up with regards to our conversation, the ecumenical dialogue that occurs in many hospitals in our country, is the following. What's different between a Catholic or a faith-based or a Christian bioethics and the bioethics that I'm doing, i.e. secular bioethics? And I've spent just professionally having conversations with them and just trying to explore what they think and how we think. I'm gonna propose that we fundamentally disagree on human dignity, but not in the way that most people think. A lot of people think that secular bioethics simply denies the existence of human dignity. I think that is not true. They do have dignity language in their discourse. It's what exactly they mean by dignity. And so we need to talk about that. Let me just highlight a couple of things that the first line of the Vatican's Dignitas Personae, this is the most recent document from the Vatican on bioethics. The first line is the following. The dignity of a person must be recognized in every human being from conception to death. And so for Catholics, this is the linchpin. This is everything about our bioethics. In fact, everything about our moral theology has to deal with human dignity. Now, a lot of people assume this is a religious concept. It is not, because if you go to the first line of the Grundgesetz, which is the Federal Republic of Germany's basic constitution, it says this, human dignity shall be inviolable. This is not as surprising that their, their constitution opens with this. Their constitution was written and drafted in 1944 by Catholics in the Christian Socialist Party, Christian Democratic, I can't remember the exact, it's either Christian Socialist or Christian Democratic Party. And they were responding to the atrocities of the Holocaust and so they say this. And so it, in the last few years, I've spent my time, I spent a lot of time going over to Germany to have conversations about what human dignity entails because they're having discussions about what this means in light of many of the ethical discussions we're having today. So what is it? And what I do when I teach this in class is I say, look, it's an answer to this question. How much are you worth? And in order for me to illustrate the difference between how a Catholic bioethicist and a secular bioethicist approaches this question, I have to ask you this question. How much is an iPhone 7, and I have, because I'm working in my class, I have to specify, they'll say, Father, how big? Uh, memory, 32, 32G, right? So I'm specifying the model, so it's iPhone 7, 32G, how much is, is it worth? Now, if I ask that, my students would be up there, they're like, depends on where you buy it, Amazon. Okay, now it's interesting because if you look at the value, if you Google this, they will, dis they will talk about two different numbers. This is called the teardown cost. So when Apple's competitors get the newest model of the phone, they break it down, and they figure out how much does it cost to put it back together again. So if you, if you had all the parts, and you how much do just the parts and everything come together? 
So for the iPhone 7, it's $219.80. Because you're dealing with competitors, there's slight range. It can go from 210 to 230. Then you have, of course, the suggested retail price. Look at that markup. It's amazing. This is $649. Now, this is the intrinsic price, and this is the extrinsic price. Notice a couple of things about these prices. This price doesn't change. That price, that price is tagged to that gadget the moment the gadget is made. And that is the price of the gadget all the way through its lifespan until it is dismantled. This price, hey, it's the day after Thanksgiving. That price is going to be different. You're going to go Amazon versus Apple. The price is going to be different. So this price doesn't change. This is varies depending upon all sorts of circumstances. This is the question. Many faith-based traditions will say that you, too, have these two dimensions. You have a, an intrinsic worth and an extrinsic worth. And so the idea here is that the intrinsic worth is the inherent worth of the human person. And when I ask my students, how much do you cost? They'll look at me and go, how much does your mother think you cost? <laughs> and they'll say, Father, we are priceless. This is exactly the intuition that the Catholic tradition and many Western faith traditions hold to. It's interesting. I grew up in Bangkok, Thailand. The Buddhist tradition does not have this intuition at all. Because if the mosquito is worth as much as you, because you could be a mosquito or you could have been a mosquito, then and we clearly have the value of a mosquito very different from the value of you, there is no inherent value of you that will specify you or denote you as a priceless individual. Now, you also, of course, have an extrinsic dignity. This is how much you are worth. Well, depends. You, your salary, your net worth. Some of us have more social worth than others. You have celebrity, right? So, I mean, the Kardashians, you look, if you ask them, what is their extrinsic dignity, their social worth? They have a lot. And then my students will say, why, Father? I go, I don't know. <laughs> You know, I, it, is, it is one of the strangest things to me that a hu the human beings who don't do anything <laughs> are worth so much. I mean, it, I think it's a, it's a reflection of our culture. So what happens is that they have extrinsic dignity. We have intrinsic. So we, we claim an intrinsic dignity and an extrinsic dignity. What I've discovered when I've talked to my, is notice, notice, right? Intrinsic dignity is not earned or bestowed. It is acknowledged and recognized. That's how much an iPhone 7 is. It is absolute. You cannot have half your worth because there's no such thing as half of an iPhone. The iPhone is one iPhone. It's always an iPhone. So there's no such thing as partial intrinsic worth. There's no partial intrinsic dignity. You can see that this is the account that undergirds the pro-life commitments of the Catholic Church. From conception until you got together, until you are broken up, death, you have a value that never changes. It doesn't matter what the heck is going on in the market. This is your value. There are other values you have as well, but this is the thing that we're going to protect. So what's interesting for Christians is that intrinsic dignity is grounded on two claims. The first claim is you heard all throughout the morning, the imago dei. If God specifies the hierarchy of value, and we are made in his image and likeness, and he is infinite value, because we look like him, we are him uh, by participation, then what happens is we, are, we also have infinite value. This is a theological claim. But there is also a, and now I didn't bring it up, there's also a philosophical claim, and this is it. If you ask yourself, which is more valuable, spirit or matter, there are arguments for claiming that spirit is more valuable than matter. 
So if, as there was discussion this morning, we have an immaterial component to us, there is a philosophical foundation for the intrinsic claim, for the, for the claim that we have intrinsic value, that we are worth so much more because we are spiritual. Now, you will notice our bioethics will say that we have to defend both intrinsic and, intr intrinsic and extrinsic accounts. When you speak to a secular bioethicist, they will deny the intrinsic dimension of dignity for the following reason. Well, they're atheists in their foundations, so what happens is they deny the imago dei that will theologically ground your claim of inherent dignity. They are also materialists. And so what happens is, if we're all matter, then there is no reason to think that you and I are worth more than intrinsically than a dog. There may be extrinsic reasons why. Now you can see why they will say, you know, death with dignity, because if dignity is extrinsic and only extrinsic, and it depends on what you are doing and the kind of person you are and whether or not you're good health or bad health or whether or not you're famous or not, then you can lose it to the point where at the end of your life you have no dignity. So that's what they've got. They only have extrinsic dignity. What they end up doing is so they will talk about preserving extrinsic dignity, so they have to make sure that extrinsic dignity, and this is all the trappings, the accidental trappings of the human person, especially within a social context. What you do, how much you mean to people, your ability to choose, your ability to choose autonomously, all of this is important because this is the only source of dignity that you have. So when we talk about CRISPR and human genome editing, we have to talk about those questions. We have to talk about dignity concern. We have to ask ourselves, now, when I talk to my colleagues who are secular bioethicists, they will say it's all autonomy concerns. So it's who gets to decide the question. So if I get to change myself, I should be able to do that because it's all autonomy concerns. Dignity concerns will talk about not about what you choose to do, but whether or not the choices that are being made infringe upon, diminish, undermine in any way intrinsic or extrinsic dignity. So there are four categories, four bins for dignity concerns that uh, my colleagues and I have identified in the Catholic tradition. I'd just like to highlight some of them. So, and as, as you can see, they all deal with persons because intrinsic dignity is a property properly uh, predicated of persons, not of things. So you've got the safety, the commodification, the marginalization, and just access. So with safety concerns, and this, I think there is, there is uh, concurrence between my colleagues from the secular bio bioethics tradition and the Catholic tradition. We just have to make sure that the technology is safe. There are prime, two primary safety concerns right now, off-target mutations. You have that encyclopedia of information. You want to change a single letter. How do you know that you're not messing up any of the other letters in any of the other pages in any of the other books? And, there, and the, the CRISPR companies, and there are also other academic labs around the world, are attempting to at least, if not prevent it from happening, from identifying it when it happens so you can cull the products that you don't want. There are chimeric issues, tissues. These are where some of the cells in the organism have been genetically altered and some have not. What are the safety concerns of that, of that type of, of technology? Commodification. So this actually is especially important in the context of Catholic bioethicists. Bioethics, when I speak to my secular colleagues, they have some concern about this, but it's really interesting. What they're mostly concerned about is others commodifying you. They actually will allow you to commodify yourself. It's in, so, and, and you know, our students, and even at Providence College, if I ask them, how many of you should be allowed to sell yourself into slavery to allow you to, to raise funds to save your mother who's dying from cancer? All of them. They're utilitarian through and through. And I'm like, but didn't we fight a war over this question? But they said, mm, they didn't know. It's very interesting. 
people, are, many of our students are not sure why slavery is a problem unless you decide it, right? So you can sell yourself into slavery. So one of the concerns, persons are treated as a means to fulfill the desires of another. I want my kid to be the next Charles Barkley. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to genetically engineer my kid so he fulfills not his desires, but my desires. So then what happens is he is a means of fulfilling my dreams, not necessarily his. And it's interesting because I have students who will say, but my parents are forcing me to become a doctor. Is that not commodification? And I want to go, oh, I don't want to say anything at that moment because <laughs> I don't want to insert myself into that. But I point out that one of the things parents can do is they can, they can discern with you looking at your gifts and your talents and your interests and invite you into the conversation. And I say, go back and ask them if they'd be willing to do that. It's a little tricky because um, you know, it's a freshman bio class or a freshman ethics class. So you're, you're trying to be very careful, otherwise you get the dean calling you up. Um, <laughs> the next thing, these are, especially in the Catholic tradition, the concern with artificial reproductive technologies and IVF is we commodify uh, human beings by manufacturing them in the lab. Notice what happens here is that the persons are made not as imago dei, though by nature they imago dei. What's happened now is they're made in the image of another, usually the person who has chosen the traits to give to uh, his or her child. Now, in marginalization of persons, the concerns are the following. The exacerbation of social divisions and inequalities. I had a student say once, Father, I know what's going to happen. A hundred years, we'll be able to, to see all the Catholics. I go, why? They're all the ugly ones. <laughs> you know, and the idea here is that everyone is going to commodify and genetically engineer their kids, especially those who are rich. And so the, the ones who are all natural, like the organic versions, they're all going to be ugly, religious, and poor. <laughs> it's really striking, but you have this perception. And the idea here is that these will make worse the already existing social divisions and inequalities that we're experiencing in society. And of course, you always have the eugenic temptation society, and this is another means of trying to realize that. Finally, and especially in the pontificate of Francis, you know, I highlight that no matter what this technology eventually does, it has to be able to address the poor. So when I go off and talk to these stem cell companies, these, well, they're, it's these CRISPR companies, I always tell them, look, I don't use uh, Catholic social te teaching, I use CSR, right? Corporate social responsibility. How are you going to make sure that your technology will be accessible to those who are not going to be able to afford it. And so, and this is, I think, the Catholic, one of the things that the Catholic Church must consistently remind technology, and especially companies, is that they have a responsible, and there's a preferential option for the poor and the vulnerable. So uh, ethical guidelines, just to conclude, it's 2 o'clock. So what you have is, in principle, somatic cell modifications for therapeutic reasons, including therapeutic enhancement, could be morally justified on a case-by-case -case basis. This is just a general framework. Germline modifications for therapeutic reasons could be morally justified. The idea here is if it's good enough to cure you, shouldn't it be good and even better to prevent you from getting sick at the beginning? The standard account here is the Immaculate Conception, the Mother of God, um, singular grace, she's preserved from original sin. Now, the again, the means were the same through the merits of her son. We, too, will be restored to life in grace. And one day, we will have bodies that will allow us to visit Sagittarius A star. But at, you know, and, and that, that, will, that change is actually something that will occur uh, because of the merits of her son. But it's already happened to his mother. And so, if, if, if we see the value of the Immaculate Conception, if we see the value of how her being preserved from any taint of sin is superior to us who are healed of sin, 
then can we take that same principle and apply it to therapy? And this is really where the debate is at the moment, honestly, because there are people who are saying that the germline is sacrosanct in some way. And I, it, when I push them on it, they're not quite sure, but it's really special. We are playing God if we alter the germline. I point out that we do this all the time. When you smoke, you're altering your germline. There are, there are effects of how we eat, especially now in light of epigenetics. It's clear that the granddaughters of obese fathers are themselves prone to diabetes precisely because of the eating habits of their grandfather. So it's really interesting that you have these kind of effects. Um, but I also point out that germline modifications for non-therapeutic reasons could never be justified. This is the hardcore enhancement account where I'm going to give you, I'm going to enhan enhance you. My students will say, well, what does enhancement do? Enhancement increases your or your family's opportunity. There's opp if you can identify opportunities why this change will make it your life better, then that's an enhancement. The, the tricky part is really uh, trying to parse out in very f finite detail the difference between therapeutic enhancement and non-therapeutic enhancement. So I'm going to end with, the, with acknowledgments. But before this, I want to return to that very first question. Can we ever create post-human beings using this technology? And it, I, I decided to just kind of link my talk to some of the earlier talks. One of the things I've discovered when we talk about species, the assumption has been in biology, and I'm a biologist, is that species is a biological category. And one of the things that's really striking, being introduced to Thomas and the philosophical tradition, is that species, there, you can define species in many different ways. There are biological ways, and there are philosophical ways. And so often, we're not quite clear when we use the word species what we are using, the context in which we are using that particular uh, definition of, of species. And so we have to figure out, well, if you're talking about a post-human, what does it mean to be human? In the classical account, a human is a rational animal, a rational creature. So just because you can fly doesn't mean you're not human, as long as you can think in the way that Professor George talked about this morning. right? So, so X-Men, Avengers, they're mutant humans, but they're human. They're not post-human, because they're still rational. Now, and people will go, are there other non-human rational creatures? I go, absolutely, angels. Right? We talk about angels, and this is where I'm going to end. Um, uh, whenever I ta give talks at scientific conferences, especially, well, only Catholic ones, for the, for the reason you'll see, one of the things that's really striking when I entered the religious life is I discovered, like many of my scientific peers, regardless of my religious belief, I was already secular in this sense. I was disenchanted. So Charles Taylor points out that the, the primary difference between a secular and a non-secular worldview is disenchantment versus enchantment. Now, I'm a Filipino, so enchantment is in my blood. You know, my grandparents would take me to a cemetery, and they'd say, look, can you imagine what it's going to be like on the resurrection of the dead? I'm like, oh my god. Like, and then they describe all the, the tombs opening and the bodies rising, and they enchanted my world. And at MIT, I was disenchanted. <laughs> and I think it's really important that as Catholic scientists, we, be op we open up our souls again to enchantment. And the, in the particular category I have to end with is angels and demons. And I'll end it with this way, right? So a few years ago, I, I attended a, an exorcism of the, of the Catholic Church. I got permission, because one of my Dominican brothers is a major exorcist. And for a few hours, I witnessed, and I saw, saw a demon, right? And, and, it, and it's one of those things that I, I, I was telling, relating the story to a student yesterday. You know, I was there going, I have a PhD from MIT. I have a PhD from, because as you hear the demon, it so challenges the categories that we usually operate in as scientists. Now, I believed in angels and demons, but I believe that they are here now. That's the big difference. That's what enchantment is about, to look around this room and to discover that there are angels and demons amongst us. Thank you very much.